Welcome back to Podcast Recovery, everyone. We're your hosts, David O. And Eric V. Today, we are joined by our special guest, Luke. How are you doing today? Awesome, awesome. Good. Great, man. Uh, so where are you from, Luke? So I'm from the UK, um, so I believe I'm across the other side of the pond to you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. We're, we're glad to have you. Where, where in the UK, if I may ask? Uh, just outside of London, uh, I'm in a seaside town called South End. All right. Awesome. So, uh, when were you first introduced to recovery? Well, when was I first introduced? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, when I was um, a kid growing up, my mum, she was an alcoholic, so kind of introduced to the idea, yeah, from a kid, really. Um, mm-hmm. But then I was introduced when one of my friends went to rehab, so I was kind of more formally introduced then. All right. And uh, how long have you been uh, cleaner or sober? So, um, I don't know the exact date, but over four years, um, it was September about four years ago. Awesome. Well, congratulations. And uh, without no, further you. ado, yeah, man, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your story with us. So take it away. Okay, perfect. Well, yeah, thanks very much, Eric and Dave, for having me on. So my story starts um, before me in many ways. My mum, um, she was an alcoholic and she grew up with um, two brothers and she was the only girl. And um, my granddad, back in the day, he was very, um, yeah, just during that time, he was very kind of like, um, not very emotional, just very keeping people in line, very strict. And my mum grew up and she, as she grew up, she wanted to be like the men and out drink the men and she just got into that drinking culture. And as time Mm -hmm. went on, her drink just got worse. And as I grew up with my dad and my mum, I was sort of aware to drinking and what was happening. And, you know, she used to put, like, vodka in the milk and all that kind of stuff we do as addicts. And as time went on and her drinking got worse, she went to rehab a few times. Um, But when I was about 10, as I grew up, she passed away. And um, as I grew up through my kind of adolescence, I always just had this belief that I don't want to be like my mum, I don't want to drink, I don't want to cause other people that much pain but as Mm -hmm. I was kind of growing up with my brothers so I had two brothers and my dad and um, as my mum died um, you know I just was around men so they didn't really show their emotion if I showed my emotions then they would like punch me or beat me up it was kind of anger was the only emotion that was okay and that was able to be expressed so I just kind of suppressed everything and just pushed everything down and then growing up, um, kind of fighting and displaying all of this anger. And that was just the foundation I was kind of being built, um, yeah, my foundation of my psychology as as it was being built. And then with my dad, he wasn't very emotional. He just kind of, as the man of the family, got on with everything, just kind of, he lost his wife. He just was sorting everything out, getting everything done, taking charge, getting us to school, all of those things. And he was awesome, but he wasn't necessarily you know, the most emotionally supportive person. And there was just nowhere for me to take those emotions. So as I grew up in my adolescence and went to school when I was about 10 or 11, and I first discovered um, drinking alcohol. Um, and then it wasn't long before I was on a school trip and one of my friends um, offered me something called a joint. I didn't know what that was. So I smoked my first joint um, on a school trip and I was, yeah, just stoned and, that was that really. So I was introduced to kind of drugs and alcohol from an early age. Um, and then I just kind of grew up through school, just smoking weed and drinking. And then it went on to smoking fags and selling fags in school. Um, mm-hmm. I discovered early on that um, what was possible with my stepmom, she used to make me sandwiches for the school bus. And then I would go and take my sandwiches and I'll sell them to other kids on the bus. So I could buy cigarettes um, over um, the sort of what we called the cross, which was a place where the kids hanged out before school. And I'd buy my cigarettes before school um, because I was never allowed money for anything like that. So I had to kind of flip my sandwiches on the school bus to then be able to get my cigarettes as I was growing up. And then Mm -hmm. as time went on and um, I grew up into my early adolescence, 
uh, I was around my two brothers. So, you know, them kind of leading by example of doing drugs and having house parties and stuff like that. Um, I just kind of grew up with them um, and got introduced to kind of harder, harder drugs, if you like, like cocaine um, and just drinking more alcohol. And I just constantly ran from the pain of the trauma uh, from my mum and I just ripped out everything that connect, connected my head and my heart and buried all of those feelings deep down in my soul. And mm. I just kept going, basically. And as I went into my adolescence, still just smoking weed, um, I went and built my own business after I finished school. And as I built this business, I thought, oh, I'm a ruthless businessman. I don't need emotions. Everything is just pure logic. And I built mm-hmm. up all of my emotions. Um, I built up the business, and I it was doing kind of well in a sense, despite me drinking and using a lot of drugs. And then things just got out of hand. I lived in this nice apartment overlooking the sea, but then we were just doing loads of drugs and driving around in a Mercedes and just trying to be Charlie Big Bananas, in a sense. Um, and mm-hmm. it just got escalated and just kept going on. And as the business built, it just got worse and worse and worse, my addiction. And I just kept doing more and more coke, drinking more, smoking more weed. And then it just started, the business just started failing and just crumbling because the clients started to notice kind of roughly what was going on. And I would kind of take the money they're paying me to do a job and I would go and spend it on drugs. And I just got to this point where the business couldn't continue in loads of debt. There was just, it was just a nightmare. So I had to just close the business. And that was when I was very close to my kind of rock bottom and I moved out of my place and I moved into like a house share with loads of other people. Um, and I just kept using drugs and using drugs. And then there was this one day when I was calling around everyone to try and get drugs and get money for drugs. And there was this one friend on my contact list and he was the friend who had been through rehab. Um, he was another entrepreneur like me. I didn't really talk to him that much, but he kind of knew the rap and he was kind of further ahead than me he was the last person on my contact list so I wanted to call to get to lend me money for drugs because I knew he knew the rap. So, uh, but I didn't have a choice so I called him anyway and I asked him to borrow money for drugs and he just turned around and said to me, he said, Luke, you're a crack addict and although I have used crack in that moment, I just thought, wow, I am an addict. It just kind of broke that whole veil, that whole denial and just shattered my model of reality. And I was yeah. like, I, and I just made that connection to my mum and I was like, the thing I've been running from for all this time, I'll never be like my mum. I then turned around and looked and the ghost I'd been you know, trying to avoid was right behind me. And she was just right there in me, if you like. And I become that thing that I didn't want to become. And I just realised in that moment, I'm just heading towards death just like her. I've lost all my business, I've lost all my connections, I've lost everything I built up, you know, I've just got myself and I'm just doing loads of drugs, I don't have any money, I was in loads and loads of debt, um, and I just realised in that moment, if I keep doing this, I'm just going to end up dead just like her, this is where this road goes, and then I just sort of made that in that moment that I didn't want to go that way, I didn't want to keep running on the treadmill, I didn't want to keep running east looking for a sunset. And I wanted to go and become my best self. And I didn't really understand what that meant. I didn't understand what recovery was. I just knew my friend had been to rehab. I didn't have the resources to go to rehab. Um, So I just went to therapy. And I booked therapy online, just some random therapists close to me. But when I first walked into my initial therapy session... I really thought I would die from bringing up the pain of all I felt, of everything I felt. I'd never opened that chest of all my emotions. I never really considered all the stuff I'd pushed down. And that just scared the hell out of me. But I slowly learned over time, I've kept going, keep going back to therapy, the uncertainty, anxiety, and just learn to kind of, um, yeah, push through those emotions, even though at that time I didn't even know there were emotions. I was just, didn't really like going, but I knew it was the only way I'd made that commitment. I'm becoming my best self. I'm not going to end up dead like my mum. Her life was not an example. It was the lesson. And that's why I always used to just repeat to myself, 
because it just made so much sense, sense to me that it didn't have to be this way and it could be different. So as I kind of went into therapy, and I was still using drugs and drinking, but I just kept going back to therapy and I'd learn a bit more and I'd have a few months over and then I would use again and I'd, like, the whole time I was going to therapy. And then my auntie, she introduced me to Alanon um, and I went to Alanon and... I guess I kind of went to Al-Anon because I was a bit worried of going to NA um, and I thought Al-Anon would just be a bit easier. Um, I guess mm-hmm. it, was, it was just focusing on my mum. I guess that's just where I was at at the time. So I went to al for a while and then I started going to NA and I went to NA for a while. And then for the whole time I was just still in therapy and I kept going back and just untangling that mess of my emotions. And it was there that I started to understand the impact of my mum's actions on my traumatic development and how that broken inner child was living inside me. And I started to gain an understanding of my subconscious thoughts and my emotions and really learn to feel again. Um, And that's one thing my therapist said to me is the best thing about recovery is you get your feelings back and the worst thing about recovery is you also get your feelings back. Um, And just learning to manage those feelings it was just like a, a long process um, and still a work in progress at the moment, just learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and process those emotions. And then as I went through the journey of therapy over many years, I then you know, decided to train and become a counsellor. And as I was going through my training, I kind of discovered um, all these different types of therapies and stuff that helped me. And um, yeah, as I went through therapy and, and trained to become a counsellor, um, I then started helping other, other people and now I work as a counsellor helping other people with their emotions and come through the process of addiction and then, you know, get help and support that they need. Um, and, yeah, I guess in terms of how my life is now, um, yeah, I never would have imagined it um, turning out like this um, when I first walked into therapy. In fact, I sat in front of my therapist and said to her, you're crazy, I'll never give up smoking weed, I'll never give up using drugs, you're crazy. And she's been doing it for years, she just kind of knew that's where I was at and just also trusted in the process. Um, yeah, here I am, I now live with my girlfriend and I work as a counsellor in a job that, I that, that I'm fulfilled in. I have my family and I've built up loads of connections and rebuilt all of those bridges and yeah, that's just where I'm at. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. All right. Awesome. Well, we definitely have some some questions for you. Uh, Eric, would you like to go first? You can go first, David. All right. Okay, Luke. Um, I kind of want to go back to, like, the beginning of your story a little bit. You talked about um, being, like, raised by men and not really having that emotional outlet as, uh, like, in your, uh, like, childhood. So how did that lack of emotional connection in your early years, how did that affect you and how did that really lead to your addiction? Yeah, so I guess I didn't know how to deal with my emotions and I guess I didn't have the permission, you know, whenever I'd feel something, you know, my Mm -hmm. brothers were just men, they were all in the situation as well, but being older, you know, if something happened, we would just kind of fight and that would be fine. If we were angry, boys will be boys. It's not a problem. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, said out loud, but there was just the impression you don't have emotions. If you have emotions, we're going to call you a girl. We're going to beat you up more. If you cry, you get beaten up even more, but you are allowed to be angry. So that just kind of really was that foundation of don't show any emotions. If you show emotions, you'll then get beaten up. So it's just that kind of, maladaptive behaviour that kind of started in me and as I grew up I just came to believe men didn't have emotions so when I ran my business I used to say to my business partner if you want a friend get a dog you know we're not friends and you know I don't have emotions I'm just a ruthless business person but really deep down I'm actually very sensitive and I'm very in tune with my emotions now but it just seems so bonkers that that's where I was at that I was at that place where You know, men don't have emotions. I don't have emotions. And, yeah, just kind of pushing all that down. And because I never dealt with those emotions, I just abused drugs. And that's what was modeled to me, that drugs and alcohol, but emotions weren't. 
it just kind of became that process whenever I didn't know this was going on, but subconsciously, whenever there was emotion, like anxiety or frustration or any emotion that came up, I would just then go and use drugs. Mm. All right. What you got, Eric? So you mentioned, um, you know, the importance of therapy uh, in your journey to where you are today. And, you know, there's a lot of different avenues to our recovery and what, what tools does your recovery encompass? Um, cause you mentioned therapy, you mentioned Al-Anon, you mentioned NA. Um, what are all the different tools you use to make sure your recovery is going in the right direction? Yeah. So like I said, I mentioned Al-Anon and NA, I think they're both great. Any kind of meetings are really good. Um, and it creates that sort of sense of, um, yeah, just feeling connected and that feeling of there's other people like me. I'm not special and different. Um, you know, we all have similar stories and you know, there's that relatability, which I enjoyed. But, I mean, therapy for me was the place where I could really do the deep work and have that space to really untangle the mess of my emotions and go really deep into every single part of my psyche and sort of rebuild it. And in terms of what actual tools um, I use, so as I look back over my recovery, I covered four main areas that I sort of un- looked into, and they were my mindfulness, so what's happening in my mind, how are my thoughts impacting my behaviour, and I guess I learned just because I have a thought, it doesn't mean it doesn't equal an action or decision. But just because I think, oh, I need to go and do a line of coke, doesn't mean that I have to go and do that. It's just a thought, and I can recognise that. And that was the mindfulness part of things and the meditation of meditating every day, um, you know, doing my, I, do, I like headspace, but doing my headspace, meditating, becoming an observer of my mind and having that objective perspective of my thoughts. So I'm not getting so caught up and attached to all those different labels. And then the next part for me was my relationships. Um, and the relationships in my life was a big part of things and I guess the most important relationship was the relationship with myself. The fact that I was very kind of a people pleaser. I didn't set boundaries. I would let people walk all over me, especially in business and clients, not charging them for things, not even sending invoices out. At the time, I just thought, oh, it doesn't matter. But then when I looked at it in therapy, I realized, wait a minute, this is all emotional. This is because you don't know how to set boundaries. You don't know. Uh, you're a people pleaser, so you just want to please everyone and have everyone be your client and your friend and you don't want to charge them any money, um, mm-hmm. which just didn't help the situation. So focusing on my relationship was important, was important and the relationship to my stepmom and the relationship to my dad and redefining not necessarily the contents of the relationship, but redefining the context and how I saw the relationship and therapy really helped with that. And then another thing I learned from therapy was um, how to deal with those situations when the shit hits the fan. You think mm-hmm. everything's going right, you think everything's going good, and then suddenly there's a massive life gives you a punch in the face. And how to deal with those intense emotions that just kind of come out of left field and deal with those kind of bends in the river. And that was one tool that I sort of learned in therapy is to sit with uncomfortable emotions, allow them to be there, that just because there's an emotion... I don't have to go and use a drug and that I can sit in that emotion um, and just experience it fully. And that leads me on to the fourth thing that I learned, which was emotional regulation. How do I actually regulate my emotion and process what's going on? Now I've opened this sort of Pandora's box. How do I manage all the stuff that's going on um, throughout the process? And yeah, they're the sort of tools I learned. And then when I came into therapy, I sort of discovered this type of therapy called dialectical behavioural therapy, which covers these four main areas of mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, distress tolerance, and emotional regulation. And it's usually like bulb went off for me, and I thought, this is all the stuff I've been learning. It's just put in a really nice theory. And that's now the process I take clients through is that 12-week programme to cover those four main areas so they can have that therapeutic growth similar to what I had just in a shorter period of time so they don't have to take the long way around. But they're the sort of main skills that I learned during my recovery. All right. 
That's awesome. All right. Um, hmm. Uh, which question am I going to ask? Uh, all right. Um, this is just sort of a, like, uh, like your opinion on, uh, how addiction is viewed. Cause, uh, I, I feel like the, the world and like society really views, uh, addiction as sort of people not being like, not being able to control, uh, their level of fun, but they see using as some sort of fun activity that then gets out of control. But how much is addiction addiction actually about, uh, mental health and emotional health and how can we change or how can we work to change like society's view on that? And not that these, like these, that we addicts are, uh, like broken people, but instead we're, we're people in need of help. Yeah. I think that is, like you say, a tragedy that a lot of society and people view addiction as people who are kind of broken and that, you know, they just kind of take things too far. But I think it's important to remember that, you know, me included, I speak from the eye, that people like me, we need help. And that it's about, emotions so different things happened in my past it wasn't my fault it wasn't the people around me fault it wasn't my dad's fault it wasn't my brother's fault it wasn't my mum's fault it was just the circumstances that I was born and raised in that created the inability to regulate my emotions and because I didn't know how to regulate my emotions when they bubbled up to the surface and they started to overflow I then drank and used drugs because I didn't know how to cope and I just wanted to switch everything off so I think it's important for people in society to remember that people need help and it's a work in progress and it's not black and white, people are bad, people are druggies. And mm-hmm. even when we look at the sort of stigmatised side of things, oh, you know, a crack addict is going to come and rob an old lady's purse. Just a random yeah. example of that, it's about understanding, you know, the pain that people are going through. Yes, I'm responsible for my actions and my behaviour. <laughs> And I'll have to make an amends and process and live with my actions. I'm not saying we should enable enable people or we should remove that sort of accountability for the actions and the responsibility, but just have more empathy, understand where people are coming from, understand that people have a different perspective and a different struggle going on and going through something different to you and just having that sense of empathy and seeing their perspective. Perfect said that that was a fantastic answer all right eric back to you all right um so uh, i guess you threw me off david with the twitter question um so uh i can i can go again if you go, want go again yeah okay all right um you talked about, uh, becoming a counselor and, uh, like I kind of have like a two part question to that. Um, how important has helping others through addiction? Like how, how important has that been in your recovery? And then also how have you learned to set boundaries with, with patients or people that you're working with to not enable them and, uh, really separate their recovery from your recovery. Yeah, okay. So in terms of how important is it to help others, I think for me personally, it's been very important. It's really nice to be able to, yeah, have that sort of meaning bigger than myself and to really Mm. align with that. If you think about people who run the marathon, rarely do they run it just for their own ego so they can put it on Facebook. They run it for a family member who's passed away and they're doing it for charity or they do it for some reason bigger than themselves. So when they get to that point in the marathon where they can't go anymore, their legs are saying no, they still push forward. And that meaning is really important. And that's the meaning I found just understanding, you know, I know the dangers of addiction. I know where it can end up. And I know that the pain that that sort of causes. So I don't want people to be like that. And I also know the other side that 
you know, we don't have to be doing drinking drugs and I've been sober for many years and I know it's possible to not do that and to learn to regulate your emotions. So I think it is important to help people and it gives me deep meaning and fulfilment to be able to help other people along their journey. Um, but at the same time, like I said, the boundaries, by no means am I complete or, you know, there's some kind of good uh, meditating on mountain top. I'm still mm-hmm. working on my too. I'm still in recovery and I still have my own therapy and, you know, go through the process and grow and work on the challenges I'm doing now. And setting boundaries um, with clients is important, even in terms of attendance of are they missing appointments, are they not? And it is a fine line to walk between are you enabling people and just letting them run riot or are you setting boundaries with them? Are you just, um, yeah, denying them from help by uh, being too harsh? And I guess that's mm-hmm. always the type of I try and walk between allowing yeah. people to make the mistake and me in therapy. I used, not in therapy, but I used while I was going through therapy. I didn't use before therapy. And I guess that's a boundary I had. If someone's coming to the session and they're drunk or they're really high or they're using drugs, I'll end the session, I respect where they're at, and I won't stop working with them. But if it happens on occasion, um, I'll say, look, we can't have the session now, but we can pick things up in the morning, um, and let's continue on. And I'll continue on that process, because I found it valuable to still be supported while I was going through and learning and relapsing and learning from my mistakes. But managing that balance between enabling and setting boundaries is a tightrope walk, and I have supervision and other counsellors around me who support me making those decisions, I guess it comes back to that sense of reflection. I don't mm-hmm. necessarily know best. It's about talking over with my supervisor and more experienced counsellor and, and just getting that second opinion. This is what I'm doing. This is what's happened with this client. This is what's going on. Do you think this is a good boundary? Where does the boundary need to be? And just sort of mm-hmm. being up to that discussion and bringing it to the table where that, where to draw that line in the sand. Awesome. Awesome. Great. All right. Um, Eric, uh, Eric is, uh, telling me to go ahead and, uh, ask my, my last question, uh, which is actually just a fun question, which I like to ask all of our international guests. So, uh, what is something weird or funny that you find, uh, about Americans? Um, something weird or funny I find about Americans um, all that comes to mind is just kind of a family guy um, and <laughs> yeah family guy always just makes me laugh um, and it just reminds me of America or American Dad um, and just yeah those kind of shows which just show that American perspective which uh, I just find interesting and it's always interesting to learn and look at different cultures and really understand, yeah, what those differences are and how to bring things together. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Okay, back to you, Eric. Go ahead, David. Do 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 your thing. Oh well, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the best part of the uh, podcast, and that is time to go to the Twitter, ladies and gentlemen. So what do we got, Eric? All right. So, Luke, the way this works is this is a round table. Um, discussion. So uh, someone from Twitter or Instagram ask us a question or a topic and you'll give your um, experience first and then David and then myself. Uh, this Twitter um, question is from Major and the question is how to go about picking a psychiatrist or a psychologist with respect to them being addiction literate. Okay, so, yeah, the the relevance or my opinion on this is I think I would look for a therapist that has experience, that's been through it, that's in recovery themselves. I think that's valuable, like myself, to know what's going on, to have that understanding and have that experience. So that would be one of the criteria. I'd also look for someone that doesn't just specialise in cognitive, like CBT therapy, but also knows a bit about kind of trauma and about emotions so we can have that holistic approach of understanding what you're thinking, what you're going through in terms of addiction and how to process and hold the space for you to manage those emotions. 
So they're just trying to be more criteria. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Having um, that sort of, like, like they said, literacy or experience in uh, recovery themselves, I think is, it, it, it can be a game changer for sure. Cause, because I know like throughout my story, uh, I different therapists and the ones that didn't have, um, and a background with addiction or didn't struggle themselves. It was very difficult for me to relate to them and really uh, take them as like a credible source because, uh, and, and that's partially on me. That's not, that's not saying they're, they're a bad therapist or psychiatrist or whatever. Um, it's, it's equally on, on me. Cause I didn't see them as a person who, who could understand what I was going through. And so I, I wasn't getting the most out of, the experience because, because of where I was at. So, um, it, it's definitely partially, uh, I think the, the patient's responsibility to be open-minded, but that's very difficult, especially when you're dealing, uh, with addiction and then addiction with mental health, emotional health, childhood trauma. It, it's, it's a very, uh, layered onion and, and trying to peel those away with somebody you don't necessarily um, uh, totally like mesh with it's, it's a difficult thing. So I think when a psychiatrist has that background, it it can really break down a lot of those earlier, those early barriers in therapy, uh, because they can relate on a very personal level. And I, I think that's for me, my, my, last therapist had gone through addiction. And so I, I really took their word very seriously. And, uh, I, I thought that helped a lot. And just having that experience in their lives was a, a, a big difference in any other, uh, doctor or professional that I had ever worked with. Hmm. So I've had a lot of, uh, therapist and psychiatrist who, um, the psychiatrist I can't speak to as much. I mean, they have training in addiction therapy, but I Mm -hmm. don't think any of them were addicts or alcoholics, but I did have a different, um, therapist who were both who, you know, went through school, um, uh, for, you know, psychology, like for addiction, but weren't addicts. And then I had ones who were in AA or NA. And for me, it's, it's easier to relate. Like if you're in a fellowship, it's going to be easier to relate some of the feelings that you're feeling. If that person has knowledge of the fellowship intimately, um, like there's Absolutely. a difference between a book knowledge of the fellowships and then a working knowledge of the fellowships. And if mm-hmm. going to a psycho, like a, someone who's going to be your psychologist and you want to work on your core problems, but you want to relate it back to a fellowship fellowship perspective, I would recommend, you know, finding someone who can speak that language. Um, Cause I mean, your help doesn't need to come from someone who is specifically has the same experience as you. If we all have the same experience and we're all sharing the same experiences, um, I don't think we're going to see, you know, all the, like the entire spectrum of life. If we're all just kind of on the same, um, path, but you know, sometimes you can get help from places you're not expecting. And just because someone didn't go through the same experience as you doesn't mean they can't help you. So it's all up to the individual and how, um, kind of how you want your recovery to be. I mean, you know, our core issues aren't always going to be met, um, in, you know, getting them met by fixing them in, um, in fellowships. So you need a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, you know, the one thing that I would say about 
being careful is with psychiatrists, if you are a, if you are a doctor shopper, um, you know, don't work it. Uh, you know, you got to be honest. So you have to, you have to make sure that you find someone who's not going to, you know, feed into your bullshit and you're not mm-hmm. going to work them because, you know, that's another kind of dangerous aspect to the psychiatrist thing. If you are or have been a pill shopper in the past is you have to find someone who's not mm-hmm. going to buy into your shit. Um, you know, yeah. cause that's something I used to do when I was, you know, inactive is I would find a doctor and if the doctor didn't prescribe me what I wanted, I would go to another doctor and I would go to another doctor until a doctor was like, yes, I will prescribe you this giant list of pills. Um, so understanding mm-hmm. who, like, it's all about the individual and what is needed at the time. And sometimes, you know, you're not sure what you need. Um, so, you know, another, and the last thing I'll say is there's always another therapist. So if you don't like someone, you can always see someone else. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely it's not a marriage. You can definitely, uh, find what you need, um, in that avenue for mm-hmm. sure. Cool. All right. Well, we, I, I think that's about it. So we would like to thank our guest Luke for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, Luke, we want to give you uh, just one last uh, moment to talk to anybody out there who's listening, anybody who's struggling, maybe not thinking they are an addict, coming back from a relapse, whatever it is. They need to hear that message of hope. What do you have to say to them? Yeah, I'll just say, if, it's re- if my story is resonating with you, just think about my mom and remember that her lesson, what her life wasn't an example, it was the lesson. And change is possible look at the people look at myself look at David look at Eric it is possible keep maintaining that hope and working towards the future and you can do it just go over and over again there is no failure just fall forward and keep coming back keep going to meetings keep going to counselling keep picking up the phone and calling people call that person call your sponsor call your friends keep reaching out and yeah, keep just moving in the right direction mm. perfect All right. Well, thanks again, Luke. Here at Podcast Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that a powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope, and Podcast Recovery is here to provide it. All right, everybody. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Uh, Make sure you uh, check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. For more information about Eric, Carly, Ali, and myself, go to podcastrecovery.com. I'm going to turn it over to Eric real quick for our media statement. What have you got, Eric? Yes, so we are fully self-supporting here at Podcast Recovery. So if um, you'd like to become a part of our home group, please join our Patreon page um, today, as well as throwing some money in the digital basket um, through our Venmo or PayPal accounts. Um, And then also, you know, like David was saying, please like, subscribe, follow, um, et cetera, et cetera, to all of our social media accounts. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, and and YouTube. I forgot about that one. And definitely like, share, subscribe on there. Everybody, please, we welcome you to uh, be part of our home group. And But most importantly, everybody out there, stay safe and stay clean.